I can't shake the feeling that we are in danger of going off a cliff. Evolution has offloaded onto consciousness a tremendous responsibility for our species. If consciousness serves an important function, as I have argued that it does, then what will happen to us if it becomes completely unsuited to our surroundings? Think about it. For thousands and thousands of generations, one after another, the conditions for making our living, for cultural and spiritual fulfillment, were essentially unchanged. At some point, thousands of years ago, civilizations began to emerge, and empires were built. Still, in the grand scheme of things, in the ways of being human, most people on earth foraged and hunted or tilled the soil and raised livestock. Family, friends, and cultural ties remained. One generation followed upon another, in which the lessons of the father were precisely applicable to the son, and to his son, and so on. In the twentieth century, the line could no longer hold. If you came of age in 1900, you saw the first automobiles slowly clanging their way on streets made for horses, then the First World War, mechanized slaughter, the first rickety airplanes buzzing low in the sky, radio broadcasts, then eventually the first television, a black and white contraption in the window of a Main Street department store, moving pictures, eventually in color. That was an astounding amount of change, but the rate is getting faster and faster. I am 40 years old, and the society I live in is barely recognizable to that of my teenage years or even my 20s. It's changing too fast. We are addicted to products and services that did not even exist a decade ago, and it looks to me like the rate of change is still accelerating. It might be social media that has broken the camel's back. The norms are all in flux. Why does it feel as if life is getting harder rather than easier? Remember the Jetsons? Whatever happened to that vision of the future? Don't get me wrong, I am not for one second suggesting that we have less than previous generations. At least in terms of choice and luxury. That's not my point at all. My point is that what makes us happy is not to do less and have more goods to show for it. We are supposed to be hopelessly striving for that condition, to earn it through hard work, to respect ourselves and the rest of our society for everything we've worked through, for having made an honest living, been an honest neighbor made an honest woman out of somebody. The crisis is that we are adapted to small clans of hunter-gatherers. We are adapted to the forest and the prairie, to looking out over the distant landscape. Now we are nearsighted, fat, and mentally ill. Look at us. We are enclosed within shallow walls, crouched over glowing screens, munching snacks out of plastic packets. And we hate it. We resent all of it. We resent it the way a caged lion must resent the meat which is dumped lifeless on gray concrete for its meal. If he had the words, he would say, I am not a lion. Well, I do have the words, and I am not a man. The problem I suggest is consciousness. We are the conscious minds of evolved human brains. When we are doing what that brain would have us do, we are pleased. We feel competent and strong. We stand tall and smile. When we fail to do so, we develop fatigue, depression and anxiety. We suffer low self-esteem, develop addiction and chronic pain. Do you know that in order to get rats addicted to drugs in captivity, we have to deprive them of their comrades? In a natural colony, they aren't much interested in the stuff. Our young people are struggling with mental illness, suicide, a crisis of identity. Or perhaps you hadn't noticed. How far from the state of nature can we push this experiment? Could we stop even if we wanted to? Even if our lives depended on it? A couple of weeks ago, I heard from Thurston Lacali at the University of Victoria in British Columbia. He told me that he liked my paper from last year and suggested that I look at a paper he published in Frontiers in Systems Neuroscience, which takes a similar look at consciousness, but does so from an evolutionary perspective. His paper is called Consciousness is a Product of Evolution. Contents, Selector Circuits, and Trajectories in Experience Space. Lucali writes, quote, Complex systems of interacting components clearly can have unexpected properties with the potential to provide a source for evolutionary innovation, and this feature has been used to advantage in a number of theories of consciousness, including integrated information theory and some variants of computational, global workspace, and higher-order theories. And indeed, 
If vertebrate consciousness is entirely a product of corticothalamic circuitry, a widely accepted view, then complexity would seem to be inextricably linked with consciousness of any kind. Here, in contrast, my assumption is that like everything else in evolution, complex forms of consciousness are more likely than not to have evolved from simple antecedents that were progressively elaborated and refined over an extended period of evolutionary time in ways that can be understood step by step in adaptive terms. This supposition is receiving increasing attention, and there is a recognition that even quite early vertebrates may play a role in the story if brain structures evolutionary older than neocortex are involved, as has been argued for olfactory centers, the optic tectum, subcortical telencephalic centers, and nuclei in the thalamus and midbrain. We would then have a much expanded evolutionary window, materially increasing the prospects of finding vestiges of early stages in the transition from consciousness as it first emerged in evolution to something more complex. The cortex in such scenarios then appears in a different light, as less a precondition for having consciousness of any kind than a device for exploiting more fully a capability the brain may have already possessed." Unquote. All right, so Lakali starts with the premise that conscious contents in the modern human context evolve from simpler contents. That is a reasonable, although uncertain, premise. Later in the paper, he goes on to elaborate a couple of models of how that might have occurred. Before that, he writes, quote, The relevant point is that the contents of consciousness vary in complexity from simple sensations like the sharp pain from the prick of a needle or the feeling of pleasure, anxiety, or fear, to the visual, auditory, and cognitive experiences of such activities as hunting prey, avoiding predators, or comprehending a lecture on cognitive neuroscience. Since my concern here is with the elaboration of experience from simple beginnings, the analysis is restricted to those contents that might reasonably su be supposed to have emerged early in evolution, and hence were available to be employed as components of later evolving, more complex contents. To this end, I make the following conjecture. That much as molecules are constructed of atoms, complex experiential contents are constructed of multiple elements among which are more fundamental units that are themselves contents but are irreducible. So to continue the analogy, molecules are reducible by chemical means while atoms are not. Hence the most fundamental units of consciousness, whatever those are, will be those that involve no procedural sub-processes and resist deconstruction by any means we currently have at hand, whether verbal argument, physical intervention, or mathematical analysis. In consequence, they cannot be apprehended except by direct experience, which makes them essentially equivalent to qualia as usually defined. I use the term here, despite its detractors, because a quale simply is and so is inevitable like the classic example of perceiving the color red, which exactly suits my requirements. The idea that qualia are fundamental units of experience is widespread in consciousness studies, but I treat them here as fundamental also for purposes of analysis and as objects of selection. Investigating consciousness from an evolutionary perspective has its own focus and agenda, and neither have been well served by existing theory. Addressing the question of what form consciousness took early in its evolutionary history is difficult to say the least, but is essential if we are ever to understand the link between consciousness as we experience it and the ancestral condition from which that consciousness derives. The current paper represents an attempt to do precisely that, but the methodology adopted is only directly applicable to a subset of experiences, namely those provisionally identifiable as qualia, for many theories of consciousness, the focus is as much, if not more so, on complex contents, i.e., those combining qualia with other products of neural activity. Vision exemplifies this greater level of complexity as the visual display, which allows the whole of the visual field to be perceived at once, has an intrinsic geometry and viewpoint that can be analyzed and understood in its own terms. One can then reasonably suppose that the properties of the display arise at least in part from the way visual input is processed and integrated, which will involve procedural rules and so is sequential, algorithmic, and by analogy, computational. Hence, the perception of a visual field as an experience is not a fundamental unit of consciousness as defined above, and its dependence on neural circuits and patterns of activity make it too complete, complex to be represented by a configuration space. Contents of this type, which are beyond the scope of this analysis, will be referred to as formats. This would include vision, which as a total experience is a format. Similarly, memory dependence makes olfaction a format, 
though the NCCs responsible for evoking individual odors could potentially be mapped to a configuration space. Language would also be a format. For both its intrinsic structure and memory dependence, as would everything that flows from the use of language, including reasoning, logic, and any form of conscious awareness with a linguistic component, unquote. I like this idea he calls a format. In the temporally integrated causality landscape, TICL, I simplified the structure of consciousness to a system containing subsystems. The integrated causality of the subsystems exist from the point of view of the integrated causality of the system in which they occur. This is how I explain the subjective nature of the mind. In this framing, a format would arise from a subsystem which contains nested subsystems. A visual experience is a good example because it contains many objects, colors, shadows, patterns, and so on, and even independently moving objects. A subsystem which contains no nested subsystems of its own would be irreducible and produce a fundamental unit of consciousness, as Lakali might refer to it. The next section I'll share from his paper suggests two different models for the evolution of qualia from ancestral qualia, what he calls ur-qualia. When he refers to selector circuits, he is talking about that subset of the neural correlate of consciousness which is responsible for a single, simple qualia. This is essentially a minimal subsystem as I have defined it in the TICL. He writes, quote, Of the various ways qualia might diverge from one another over evolutionary time, the figure shows two ends of a spectrum of possibilities and can be interpreted as applying either at an individual or population level. However, at the individual level it is more meaningful, and this account will assume that we are dealing with a situation of high redundancy, i.e. where multiple selector circuit replicates act in concert. We can then have a situation where the ur quale is evoked by a point cloud of selector circuits distributed over a large domain capable of evoking a multiplicity of qualitatively different sensations combined together in a single resultant experience. The sequence of progressive refinement would follow what I have chosen to call the evaporating puzzle scenario by analogy to the uneven evaporation of a large shallow puddle, leaving smaller residual puddles behind within the original outline. By analogy, in this scenario, as evolution progressively eliminates some selector circuits, those that remain would respond to sensory input by evoking a progressively more restricted set of qualia, each representing an element of experience present in the ur quale from which they all derive. An example might be an ur quale that, in, in this ancestral condition, combined together an assortment of negative feelings, such as fear, anxiety, panic, despair, and disgust, that come to be experienced separately by more highly evolved brains." Unquote. So the first model is the evaporating puddle. We can imagine a kind of low-resolution negative feeling taking up a large proportion or perhaps even the whole of a conscious experience. It has something in common with fear and disgust and sadness and pain, but with none of the detail which we are able to distinguish as complex human beings. Lakali suggests that over the course of evolution, selector circuits are eliminated. This results in separate islands, disconnected selector circuits that come from a common ancestral circuit. It's an interesting idea, though highly speculative. Lakali goes on, quote, The second alternative is the tree scenario, where the selector circuit variants are more tightly clustered from the outset in a small domain, so as to produce an ancestral ur quale of a more restricted kind. Over time, the original domain could then spawn subdomains that diverge like branches from a stem, so that the new experiences evoked by the selector circuits in each subdomain become realized contents. The experiences themselves are then well-defined throughout, but change incrementally in character as evolution explores surrounding regions of selector circuit space. Because the selector circuit point cloud is small from the start, a higher degree of developmental precision would be required throughout this branching process compared with the puddle scenario. Also, since the tree fans outward over time, novel divergent experiences can evolve that differ in significant ways from the ur quale. One can then ask, of all the qualia we experience, how many, if any, trace their origins to patterns of the above kind and hence are related through homology. A plausible conjecture is that this is most likely to be the case for qualia sharing related sensory modalities. Unquote. In Lakali's second model, the selector circuit starts small and limited, then expands to produce new related circuits that produce related qualia. In this case, with regard to negatively valenced emotions, we can imagine something like a dull pain or despondency in the ancestor developing into a number of related, refined feelings, sorrow, guilt, fear, worry, and so on. 
What I prefer about this model is that in all likelihood, these new circuit branches would be anatomically connected to and in communication with the original selector circuit, the would-be trunk of the tree. The amygdala comes to mind. This structure has long been understood as the fight-or-flight center, but we expect to see activation of the amygdala in all kinds of negatively valenced emotional states, regardless of their details, so the details might come with the co-activation of some number and variety of associated branch circuits. Natural selection works upon the frequency of genes in a population. New genetic variants emerge, usually with subtle mutations that might have a slight change on protein function and distribution. There are also transcription factor genes which could become modified to change the timing or the quantity of expression for other genes. Whichever cases result in some advantage will tend to proliferate in the population, and major evolutionary change can occur over sufficiently long periods of time. DNA is not going to be directly implicated in qualia, but genes direct the formation and function of neural circuits. A circuit could get bigger or smaller or otherwise change in anatomical form. Furthermore, the function of the circuit might change in any number of ways. It seems likely, given the repeating cortical columns we see in mammals, that more cerebral cortex essentially amounts to having more columns. Their basic function as individual units is quite similar to one another. Evolution might therefore increase the number of similar circuits. In the case of human evolution, we see an increase in the size of cerebral cortex. This suggests that Lacalle's second model is more parsimonious. His two models are essentially one of refinement and one of elaboration. Let me think about this with respect to the TICL framework. Let's take two mammals which we assume to be conscious beings, a dog and a monkey. The monkey has a larger cerebral cortex than the dog, but you would recognize both brains as pretty human-like, with folded, undulating outer surfaces of cortex in both cases. Probably there are much simpler brains which produce conscious experience. For the sake of this analysis, let's consider the dog to be like an early mammalian predecessor to the monkey. I realize that this is not an accurate picture, but it will do the job for our purposes. We know that the dog is far less intelligent than the monkey. Moreover, I assume that both are fully conscious, which is to say that they are aware of contents in the present moment. Lacali would presumably be favorable to this depiction. For the temporally integrated causality landscape, we recognize that the thalamocortical system contains a large, causally integrated system with smaller subsystems inside of it. These subsystems are more integrated within their own circuit than they are to the rest of the system. From the point of view of the system, the subsystems are meaningful contents. The more subsystems, the more can be simultaneously experienced, and smaller subsystems will be nested within larger ones. I think this has a lot to do with intelligence, because this process of nesting enables the direct comparison and evaluation in terms of one another. This is especially apparent if you don't limit your thinking about qualia to the sensory domain. A psychiatrist hands you a photograph of a living room scene. She says, Tell me everything you can about what you see. You list the objects and furnishings that you see. There's a sofa with a dog, a throw pillow, a couple of blankets, a picture in a frame, and so on. Then you go further. You could elaborate for a long time on any given feature of the photograph. One blanket is blue. It looks to be thick and fluffy, and it is neatly folded on the arm of the sofa. The other blanket is thinner, like a towel. It is a pale red color, a sort of pastel pink. It is draped casually over the seat with a number of random-looking folds. It looks to have been tossed in place casually, and so on. You could talk for hours like this, going over each object and then how that object is situated relative to other objects. You could relate stories and memories of your own that come to mind as you look at the picture. You can do all of this because you are intelligent. But how do you do it? I suggest that the features of the picture are nested conceptually and perceptually within a configuration which is reflected in the subsystems of your ongoing thalamocortical functioning. As for the dog and the monkey, I expect that the monkey is capable of more of this than the dog. More subsystems and more nesting. Nesting brings more and more contents to bear within a common experience. This enables more and more subtle distinction into view and into thought. Thus, I think the TICL favors the elaboration model of selector circuit evolution, Lacali's second model. In the introduction to this episode, I was lamenting the misfit between our modern condition and that of our ancestors. We have never known a time when we were not called upon to go against our own nature. We take it for granted that if something feels good, or exciting, or natural, then it must be resisted. This is a cultural adaptation, a necessary one. It's a painful necessity. 
We must resist food and cigarettes and sex and drugs, sit down and shut up, get to work on time. We've done a pretty good job on the whole. Our, cult our cultures have taught us discipline. We can read and write. We have technical skills. We can hold down a job and raise children and follow the law. We can make friends and develop hobbies and work our way into a pretty good way of life. It's not too bad, but it comes at a cost. The cost of personal responsibility. And there is a peril which we cannot know whether humanity will survive. How far can we push away from the state of our evolved nature without losing our minds? Well, that's the phrase, isn't it? Losing our minds? I'm afraid it's quite the opposite of that. We will keep our minds and lose reality. The only reality we know is the one which makes contact with our senses, the one which is laundered by neurology into a million trains of spikes passing through a neocortex. The colors we see, the figures and their forms, the voices and the tones, the tastes and smells, the feelings on our skin, all of these were built by generations of evolution to fit us perfectly to our surroundings, specially tuned to the conditions of nomadic primates, nomads on the prairies of a lost world. Thank you.